Good morning. morning. It is a delight to be with you always here at Greenwood Hills. Let's turn in God's word, please, to the gospel according to John chapter 1. Gospel of John 1. I'll just say, Anastasia, when she was born, we had a complication where the umbilical cord was wrapped around her neck a few times. So they had to do an emergency C-section. And those who are familiar with that sort of thing know you have to stay in the hospital longer for your recovery, therefore. So although she was born on the 22nd of December, which was the birthday of our late brother Randy Amos, a good friend of ours, and his daughter Mary Beth as well on that day. And so it's a good date on the calendar to us. A lot of good associations there. But she was born on the 22nd, but we didn't actually bring her home till the 25th. And there's a long a grueling story about even getting out of the hospital on Christmas Day, hanging around for hours, waiting for a doctor to sign a piece of paper so that we could leave. And I distinctly remember <laughs> getting home, having Christmas dinner at my parents' house, putting her under the tree, taking her picture, and then going to bed. <laughs> so, because Naomi was exhausted and I was not far behind, although she definitely had the worst of that deal. John chapter 1 and verse 1. We thank the Lord anyway. Anastasia truly is the gift that keeps on giving. And uh, we're thankful for the other gifts the Lord has given us, our other three children besides her. And appreciate your prayers for all of them as they navigate, as we all do, in a fallen world. And it's difficult. They all profess to know the Lord Jesus. It's difficult to stand for the Lord in these days. And uh, young people especially need our prayers that they learn of the Lord and learn what it is to walk with God, even as Enoch and Noah were said to walk with God in days that were dissipated and exceedingly evil. And so it's possible, but we need much prayer, don't we, dear saints? John chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now those are very familiar verses, I know, and you probably can quote them from memory. It's the sort of scripture that we've heard read so often We maybe haven't even had to memorize it. We haven't had to work at memorizing it anyway. It comes very easily. And yet, for a compendium of profound truth, one would be hard-pressed to find in a few sentences the depth and the profundity of truth about God. And I want to speak with you this morning about knowing God. Now, I don't think I'll tell you anything you don't already know. This is just in Peter-like fashion, to stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. And we once more want to gaze on the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to look at our God as revealed in his Son, because we know in looking at him, it's in the face of the Lord Jesus that we see the glory of God, and we are even conformed to his image as we look upon him. So may the Holy Spirit apply the word and do that in each of our lives this morning. In the beginning was the word. It's one of the famous beginnings of the Bible. You know, the Bible starts with the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1-1 says. And there's that fundamental truth that really changes everything else. That if that statement is true, everything's on the table as far as what the Bible teaches. Everything that the Bible tells us makes perfect sense. If there's a God who created the world, and there is, then we understand what he's talking about through Scripture. But this beginning goes back even before that. In the beginning was the Word. Here is a timeless beginning. Because this Word, even by the verb tense, and Greek, like Spanish, and like other Romance languages, uh, the Romance languages have inherited this from the Latins and the Greeks, that they're able to express different points in time with greater specificity. And the idea is that the word was and continued to be. Or we might say that he always was. 
This was an ongoing state. So you could say about a human being, like, for instance, verse six, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now, that's the same word in English, different word in Greek. If we want to be a little more specific, it could be translated. There became a man sent from God whose name was John. There became a girl named Anastasia Inez Kaiser. She was born on December 22nd. And I have to do the math now, 2006. I always forget. The, I know the days they were born, but the years I have to think about. You could say there was a man born on February 9th, 1973. Just so you have some time to pick out my birthday gift, uh, you know, named Keith. There was a time, in other words, when human beings, ordinary mere mortals, we might say, when we began to be. But when we talk about this one whom John 1 1 describes as the word, there never was a moment when he began to be. He always was. As he later describes himself in the book of Revelation, I am he who is and who was and who is to come. So this being is not only timeless, we can say he's eternal, not just eternal in that he will go on forever. That is true but eternal in that he's always existed. So you can go back and think before anything was, and already there was the word. Now, not just the word. It says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. The pronoun again being a little more specific there, not just with God as if they're in the same place, although that's true. Before anything else, there was the one true God whom the Bible reveals in a trinity. He is a triune Godhead. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God in three persons. I can't explain that. I can't understand that. There are much lesser things in the world that I can't explain. I don't understand E equals MC squared. You know, Newton, I mean, uh, Newton. I, no wonder I don't understand it. I have it attributed to the wrong physicist. Einstein's theory of relativity is what I mean to say. I don't understand, you know, uh, things about, I don't understand calculus. I don't understand uh, many principles of economics. I don't understand construction. But when we come to God, we say, you know, the highest intellect, the greatest brains, the people endowed through history with the most tremendous endowment of gray matter, the people that have devoted themselves to the life of the mind, the philosophers and the scientists and the thinkers who have tried to figure out God, even if they're a believer, they can't say, I fully comprehend him. I fully understand him. And yet here's one who in the beginning was with God or again, more specifically, the pronoun is towards the word was towards God. Now, that's a very evocative word picture, because I, I can tell you, I read another scripture this morning in third John in my personal reading where John says to the believers there, I don't want to write everything to you in pen and ink because I'll come to you shortly and I will speak to you. Face to face. OK, and uh, it's actually mouth to mouth in the original Greek, but face to face makes sense in our culture. Right. And we think about that. If I say, well, I want to talk to Jeff Nicholas to his face. You know, I don't want to speak behind his back. Now, we know what that imagery is saying, right? That there's an open and a free conversation and even that there's honesty. I remember up on the hill here many years ago at a youth conference, uh, a certain young man that I knew who was uh, talking to a very attractive young woman. And it was obvious that he was enjoying talking to this attractive young woman. It was equally obvious to a bystander by my, like myself that she was not at all interested in what he was saying. She was trying to be polite, but when he would look away, she's like looking at the birds, you know, she's looking at the ionosphere. She's probably contemplating E equals MC squared for all I know. It was just evident by her body language that she was just not interested in the conversation, right? Now, you can imagine, if you see body language like that, if you see someone between the meetings back in the lobby there, and I didn't see this, this is just hypothetical, but if you see two brothers standing back there, and the one brother says, 
and turns his back on the other brother. You say, oh, that's bad. There's been something done now that's interrupted this communication, interrupted the discussion they're having. Maybe that's brought some kind of barrier in the friendship or in the relationship. Because they've done what? They've turned their back on this other person. Now, that's strong body language. And we bring it over again into an expression. We say, oh, that person turned their back on me when I needed them. And that's a sad thing, isn't it? But think about it from eternity. In the beginning was the word and the word was towards God. So from all eternity past, before there was anything else, what do we know was happening? Well, we know the father and the son were together face to face, as it were. They were enjoying communion and fellowship with one another. They were in harmony and agreement. There was complete unity between father and son. And we know as the revelation of God's word goes along that it was Unity with the Holy Spirit as well, that the three persons of the Trinity have always been united. They've never fallen out. They've never disagreed. They have never have a, a different opinion one from another. They've been united from eternity past. And when the son of God came to earth and became incarnate, when he became a man, he did not cease to be God. He was still that eternal word and he was still in full and complete fellowship with his father and with the Holy Spirit. The only time in all of our Lord's earthly sojourn, and we might say the only time in all of eternity from the past to the future where there was any division between God and the Father. It was not a division because of anything the Lord Jesus did or said. Because the Bible is adamant that he always did those things that pleased him. That's what the Lord Jesus said. The Bible is adamant that the Father was ever and always pleased with his Son. We heard it this morning in the Lord's Supper. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And the Father always appreciated, always loved the son. And I may say reverently, never more so than on Calvary. The picture of Genesis 22 is of Abraham and Isaac going both of them together to Mount Moriah. And Genesis 22 tells us that twice, I believe, so that we don't miss it. They're going together. It's not just the father sending his son to do something that the son is not on board with, that the son doesn't want to do. The Lord Jesus tells us over and over, particularly in the Gospel of John, the Father sent the Son. But the Son also came willingly and voluntarily. He said, for this cause was I born, and for this reason I came into the world that I might bear witness to the truth. In John 18, when he was talking to Pontius Pilate. So imagine, here is one who's always been in agreement with the Father. And again, when we say there was just one time when there was division, it was not a personal division. Because the Father was still pleased in him. But the Father could not act toward him in paternal feeling. When the Lord Jesus, as the Lamb of God, took our sins on himself. John 129 is going to tell us that behold, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. First, Peter, two is going to say he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Isaiah 53 was read in the earlier meeting that the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so in becoming the sin bearer and in dying as our substitute, as Second Corinthians 521 says in the Holy One who knew no sin Becoming sin for us, that, of course, was the time when God, as the righteous judge of the universe, poured out on him his righteous anger against sin. All of the just judgment that sin deserved. All my sins, so great, so many, the hymn writer said, in his blood are washed away. And there, as the Lord Jesus became the sin bearer and offered the right payment to God, the redemption payment. We have a propitiation, a sacrifice now that enables the holy God to come forth and say, though I'm holy and hate sin, I love sinners because I can put away sin. Indeed, I've done it. I have put away, as Jesus 
put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And our Lord Jesus Christ has reconciled us to God. If we know him by faith, at least, if we've repented of our sin and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, save me. In whatever way we said that to the Lord, whenever that occurred, we've been brought into a right relationship with God. So whereas the word ever and always was towards the father, was always in harmony and agreement with God. Now, through the Lord Jesus Christ, we are brought into harmony and agreement with the father as well. And can you imagine it? There's never a moment when the father looks on you with anything else but infinite love, not because of who you are, not because of your performance, which is good, because sometimes on a Tuesday I've been known to misbehave and odd times on Wednesdays and Thursdays as well. And well, let's not talk about Friday nor Saturday for that matter. And oh, if you followed me around on the Lord's day, I can behave very badly indeed. But do you know what never wavers? God's love for me in Christ. God looking at me and seeing me, as Ephesians 1 puts it, accepted in the beloved one, accepted for the Lord Jesus sake, we might say in Christ is what the epistles say about a believer over and over again. Now, that doesn't mean that sin is unimportant to God. It doesn't mean that he's not chastening us, disciplining us, teaching us sanctifying us, in other words, developing eternal life in our lives on a day to day basis, making us more holy, working through us by his word in the power of the spirit of God to make us like Christ. He's doing those things. And when we sin, we have to deal with it, even as believers, although God's love never wavers towards us. We have to come to him, as 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have to come to him for what the Lord Jesus pictured in John 13, getting our feet washed. Because although you may have been bathed all over, like the priest was bathed all over when he was put into the priestly office in Exodus 28, He had to come every day he worked at the tabernacle and get water from the laver and wash his hands and feet. Because this is a dirty old world. And invariably, we as believers, we sin. We need our feet washed. Now, we don't need to sin because we have an advocate with the father. We have one who can strengthen us against sin. We can overcome sin, but we still sin. And when we sin, we can go to the Lord and say, Lord, wash my feet. And yet... Never for a moment does he say, well, you know, I saved Keith, but do you know what he did last Monday? (laughs) I mean, that was really bad. Maybe if I had thought about that, I wouldn't have saved him in the first place. No, God knows the end from the beginning, right? And when the Lord Jesus died on the cross, he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Not one of them or some of them or the sins up to Calvary, because And no one here lived before Calvary. I mean, some of you may feel a bit geriatric or elder and and you may say, well, I've been on the earth a long time. None of you have even close been around before the cross, were you? (laughs) No, we look back to that cross and we say all the sins leading up to the cross. Yes, the Lord Jesus paid for them, but all the sins since then. All the way to the end of the world, for that matter, the Lord Jesus foresaw them and the Lord Jesus paid for them as well. And our great salvation leaves none out. We can say Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. First John 1, 7 says. Now, what's more, it says. The word was God, which makes total sense, because if this is an eternal being who is perfectly united to the father in perfect harmony with fellowship from eternity past, who could really understand the father and enter into all the father's thoughts and all his mind? We sang in the earlier meeting this morning, Lord, thy heart alone can measure What the father found in me. That's a great piece of poetry there. Very insightful theology. Because again, it says, even looking back on what God has done through Christ, even looking back on the gospel, the good news of salvation by faith in him. 
we think about it. Now, how many Lord's Suppers have you been to? I've been to thousands in my lifetime. I'm now at least middle aged, probably much more than middle aged. OK, because <laughs> I'm 48 years old. And and uh, given if we count the rapture, who knows? I could be in the last, you know, this could be the 11th hour. I don't know when the Lord's coming. But so far, I've sat in the Lord's Supper thousands of times in my life. And do I know everything there is to know about the death, resurrection, ascension, much less the life and work of the Lord Jesus Christ? No. In heaven, shall any of us say, oh, now I fully understand Christ. Now I totally get God. I understand him to his depths. I know all about him. I know all about his work. No. Because you read Revelation about the worship that's going on in Revelation 4 and Revelation 5 and at other times during the book. And they're still talking about the wonder of God's creation in chapter 4, the wonder of his redemption in chapter 5, the wonder of his work all the way through to the end of the book. And you get the idea. This is what we're going to talk about for eternity. Now, this is why God isn't a universalist. Not everybody's going to heaven. Not everybody is saved. Not everybody shall be saved. Could everybody be saved? Absolutely. Because again, the Lord Jesus, as 1 John 2, 2 tells us, is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but for the whole world. So is there enough merit, so to speak, or value in the blood of the Lord Jesus that every man, woman, and child who's ever lived could be saved? Absolutely. What is the thing then holding back from everyone being saved simply this that to be saved you have to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as verse 12 in this passage is going to tell us to as many as received him to them gave he the right or the authority to become the children of God see God isn't going to force himself on people and if people adamantly tell him no I don't want you they're going to miss out on that Now, small wonder, we talk to unbelievers sometimes and we tell them about eternal life and they say, well, why would I want to go to heaven? Sometimes they have very silly ideas of what heaven is. I've had people say, you know, sitting on a cloud playing a harp or something. Well, that's Daffy Duck theology. Okay, I remember that in Looney Tunes. I don't remember that sort of thing in the Bible. Okay, not that I'm against the harp. I mean, if it's well done, okay. But there are other instruments I like better, but never mind. (laughs) Now, see, the thing about heaven is if you don't like the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not going to like heaven because heaven is all about God. And God has revealed himself through the Lord Jesus Christ, as he later would tell Philip, his disciple in John 14. He that has seen me has seen the father. This chapter is going to tell us no man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten who is in the bosom of the father He hath declared him or he hath exegeted him. In other words, he's brought out what God is really like. And if we want to know God, that's my subject this morning, knowing God, we must have the Lord Jesus. It's indispensable. You can't know God through Buddha. You can't know God through Muhammad. You can't know him through Joseph Smith or Jim Jones or David Koresh or name your flavor of the week guru that's out there somewhere. You can't know God through any of these charlatans and fakes and idols. You must know God through the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Only he can reveal the Father because only he is the one who actually was God. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, says First. Timothy 3.16. And the truth of John 1.1 1, 1 agrees with that. The word was with God. All things were made through him, verse 3 says. And without him, nothing was made that was made. Mr. Darby has something like nothing received being apart from him. Uh, and apart from him, nothing that has being had being. So everything that is exists through him. God created the universe through him. Colossians 1 would add that not only were all things created through him, but for him. So he's the heir of all things. He's the one who all this was made for. Hebrews 1 agrees with that idea as well. 
And here this creator God is also described in verse four as life in him was life. Now, you understand whether we talk about physical life or we talk about spiritual life, eternal life, as the Bible calls it. The Lord Jesus is the source of that. Without the Lord Jesus, there would be no physical life. The Lord Jesus is the creator. Okay, he gives life. But he would later say in this same gospel, in his prayer to his father, John 17, 3, he would say, and this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Now, there are all kinds of experiences out there among human beings today. There's all kinds of people living different ways. There are people that have brain function and their hearts are beating and they are respirating. So from a technical medical point of view, they are alive. But you know what? Today, all they're thinking about is how do I get my next fix? How do I get, you know, more heroin, for example? How do I get more opioids? We've known some people like that. And that's sad. And we could say to such a person, you, you know, there's more to life than that. And they can't conceive of it. They're held in such bondage, in such slavery to these chemicals that all they're thinking about is how do I get my next hit? How do I get high again? How do I get just enough so that I don't go through the physical symptoms of withdrawal and get very ill and it's ugly? Okay, how do I do that? We'd say to such a person, that's not living. Well, what is living? You say, well, living, you know, that's having the big yacht on the Riviera. It's having the penthouse apartment overlooking Central Park in New York. It's having the summer home in the Bahamas or maybe the winter home in the Bahamas would be better. It's having the cottage at Greenwood Hills. You know, that's really living. Now, does the Bible condemn any of these things? Well, there's some really godly people in the Bible that had ships. Okay, so God's not against ships or boats intuitively. And there's plenty of people that had a variety of houses. Some godly ones in the Old Testament had numerous houses. And even in the New Testament, you get some people that were people of means that opened their homes to use them as launching points for the gospel. That great businesswoman, Lydia, the seller of purple, comes to mind from Acts 16. One who really helped the gospel get a foothold in Europe and the beginning of the pioneer work in the church at Philippi and so forth. So God's not against those things in themselves. But if that's all you have in life, we again would say, what's the point? Because at the end of the day, as the Bible reminds us, we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out. Now, even in your lifetime, you can see those things go away. There are plenty of stories, even in modern history, of people that have become fantastically wealthy and they've had all those wonderful things that people aspire to. And in their lifetime, they've seen all those things go away. I mean, yes, there are rags to riches stories, but there's also riches to rags stories, aren't there? And the thing is, even if you can hold it and keep it in this life, this life is comparatively short and you can't take it with you. So you're not going to find satisfaction, as Solomon explained in Ecclesiastes. The eye is not filled with seeing nor the ear with hearing. You can give yourself to pleasure in this world, whether that's in material things or whether that's in experience or whatever, and you won't be satisfied because the only thing that really provides contentment is what First Timothy six talks about. Godliness with contentment is great gain. That way, whatever you have, you're content. You say, take the world, but give me Jesus. All its joys are but a name, but his love abideth ever, the hymn writer said. And we say, amen. What's eternal life? Not a home in heaven, as nice as that is. Not a dwelling place in the father's house, as good as that is. Not the streets of gold and the names on the gates of pearl, as wonderful as all those things are. But what makes heaven, heaven and eternal life worth having, what the Lord Jesus himself called abundant life is having Christ, having that relationship with him, knowing the Lord Jesus, 
and knowing the Father through him. Now, whether we remember it or not, every Sunday when we take that bread and cup, we're saying this afresh. We're proclaiming the Lord's death, you say. Yes, 1 Corinthians 11 tells us so. But you remember when the Lord Jesus took the cup? He said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood, which he shed for many. Now, what, pray tell, was the new covenant? You say, well, Jeremiah 31 talks about it. Uh, Various passages in Ezekiel talk about it as well. Uh, The new covenant, isn't that where God told Israel that he will be their God and they'll be his people? Oh, that's true. And you say, didn't the new covenant also say that they shall know the Lord from the least to the greatest? Again, true. And doesn't it say that God will write on their minds and hearts his law? Absolutely right. And finally, you say, doesn't it say our sins and iniquities he'll remember no more? Yes, it says that as well. Go to the head of the class. And when we come to First Peter 2, for example, Peter tells us, you who were not a people are now the people of God. You who had not obtained mercy have now obtained mercy. Ephesians 2 tells us that we were far from God. We were strangers from the covenants of promise. We were outside the commonwealth of Israel. But now in Christ, we've been brought near. And every week when we take the symbols, we're saying afresh, yes, Lord, I know you. Yes, you are my God and I'm your people. I submit to you. As 1 Corinthians 11 hammers away, look at how many times he talks about the Lord in that passage. You are my Lord. You're in control of my life. I want to submit to you. I want to do your will. I want to worship and praise you and live for you. Yes, you are my Lord. And my sins and iniquities you'll remember no more. Yes, I'm forgiven and I'm justified. As we heard again from Isaiah 53 this morning. And what's more, you're even now writing on my mind and heart your law. In other words, not just having the Ten Commandments outside of us like they did in the Old Covenant, where they put it on tables of stone, but the Holy Spirit is writing his word on our minds and hearts. Now, is God still going to do that with Israel in the future? Absolutely. The period of time prophetic students call the tribulation, there's going to be a remnant that is restored to the Lord. And they're going to enter into that new covenant. And that's going to be the basis of the Lord's millennial reign. And yet we're already brought into those blessings now if we're a brother or sister in Christ, if we've received the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, not only was he life, but verse four says the life was the light of men. Now, light in the Bible tends to speak about a few things uh, beyond physical light, of course. Light can talk about truth. It can talk about the opposite of error. Like, for example, Psalm 119 tells us the entrance of thy word giveth light. Okay, it gives instruction. It shows us the way we ought to walk. Wherein, uh, Psalm 118 also asks the question, how can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed to thy word. And that same psalm says, thy word is a light unto my path and a lamp unto my feet. So we get the idea of illumination as teaching, as truth, as God showing us the way. But of course, light is also the opposite of darkness, isn't it? First John 1 tells us, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So, not only is there not any error in God, there's not any falsehood in God. God is the truth. And the Lord Jesus would say of himself in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. In the same passage, he would call the Holy Spirit the spirit of truth. While God is the truth, that's absolutely certain, God is also pure. He is goodness. He is everything antithetical or opposed to evil. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So think of this. The God who is life, the one who gives natural life and to those who will receive it, eternal life is at the same time the light of men. You know, God gave us a wonderful piece of furniture in the tabernacle to remind us of these twin aspects of God's character. It's called the lampstand. Now you say, well, the lampstand. Yes, that's a light, isn't it? It was the only light in the holy place. The holy place, after all, was inside of a tent. It was under numerous animal skin coverings that were over that linen that composed the tent. 
Well, you're right. It was the only light inside the holy place. And so we see the light there. But what was the lampstand to look like? Well, when you go back and you read Exodus and the description, it is designed like an almond tree. It's made to look like a tree. Some scholars even think it's made to look like the tree of life. But Exodus says explicitly that here it has a trunk. It has branches and they have almonds in three different phases. You've got the seed, you've got the bud, you've got the flower, the the seed, the fruit and the flower, I guess, is the way to describe it. And that's showing us those twin things that come together in the Lord Jesus, that he is life. He is the one that gives us life. And that life is transformative. It not only brings us into the truth, it not only shows us reality about ourselves, about God, about the world and where it's heading, about everything, about the universe, we might say. But it's also life that we're brought into a life of knowing God. This is what eternal life is all about, to walk with God, to be called like Abraham was the friend of God, to be like Moses and speak to God face to face. This is our great privilege if we're a believer. Now, of course, it's not without opposition. Verse five says, and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now, comprehend it sounds pretty simple, but really underlying that is a Greek word that much ink has been spilled over. And there are different ideas as to what that word means, as your translations might reflect this morning. We could take it in the King James and the New King James, which I'm reading this morning. We could take it that way as comprehend. And we could say, you know, understanding that the darkness didn't understand the light. Oh, was that true? We can say, yes, that was true, because even in this passage, there are Jews that come from Jerusalem to the forerunner, John the Baptist. And they ask John, who are you? Why are you baptizing? Are you that prophet that Deuteronomy 17 spoke about? Are you Messiah? Are you, you know, one of the other prophets that's risen up? No, says John, I am a voice. Prepare ye the way of the Lord, right? I love about John that he's always pointing away from himself, always pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. What a believer. That's what we ought to be, right? Don't look at me. Look at Christ. Anything good you see in me, look at the Lord Jesus. It's him. It is God who works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure, Philippians 2 says. It's God. It's because he's given me new life that I'm different. It's him working through me. I'm just a part of the body that he's using. That's what we ought to say as believers. And John would always point to the Lord. There comes one after me who is preferred before me because he was before me. He understood chronologically. Jesus of Nazareth was born after John the Baptist. But John understood the truth of one one in the beginning was the word. This is the eternal one. This is the one Micah five two says whose goings forth have been from of old, even from days of eternity, it says in the Hebrew there. So this is the eternal one who's come forth and he's of higher rank than I. And yet people didn't understand it. Most people didn't grasp it. By the end of the chapter, there's a few people that have come to the Lord Jesus and they've said, Rabbi, where dwellest thou? Because John told them, behold, the Lamb of God. Look at him. That's the one I'm talking about. That's the Messiah who is to come. And they come and even coming to Nathaniel, Philip says, we found Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And Nathaniel's like, oh, really? Who's that? Jesus of Nazareth. Oh, says Nathaniel. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Sort of like, can anything good come out of Birdsboro or Pottstown? You know, obscure places. People ask me, I travel around and they say, where are you from? Well, I was born in Pottstown. Deer in the headlights look. No clue. Oh, where do you live now? Birdsboro. Oh, that's even worse. You know, at least Pottstown, I can say Daryl Hall of Hall and Oates, the singers. He was born there, too. (laughs) Uh, Whatever. (laughs) That's not going to get too much credit from most people. And they say, where is that? Kind of near Philadelphia. Oh, okay, we've heard of that. You know, they nod. (laughs) Obscure place. Even places that because of their 
origins as iron towns that go back a couple hundred years aren't respected. They aren't prestigious. Even in our county, where we live isn't prestigious. Where I was born, which is the neighboring county, isn't prestigious there. Uh, and they're more, you know, uh, that's kind of someplace you blink, you miss it, you know. It's not very important. That's how Nazareth was. Nathaniel says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? So you see, even as the light is shining, even those who are predisposed to want the light, even those who are looking to God for revelation, because Nathaniel's under the fig tree meditating about God. He wants to know God. And yet when the light comes to him initially, he doesn't recognize it. He doesn't know. And he said, come meet the Lord Jesus. You can make your own you know, decision. And the Lord sees him coming and says, behold, an Israelite in whom is no guile. And he says, Rabbi, from where do you know me? He says, before Philip called thee, when you were under the fig tree, I saw thee. And he says, Rabbi, you are the Christ. You are. Uh, sorry, let me get his quotation exactly right. He says to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel in verse 49. That's a great confession. We often think about Peter at Caesarea Philippi in Matthew 16, saying, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Or we could think about Martha in John 11, saying, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, that you're the one, uh, you know, that we're looking for, essentially. These great confessions. But Nathaniel's is equally great. You're the Son of God. You're the King of Israel. And the light didn't always under, wasn't always understood, shall we say. It wasn't comprehended. The darkness didn't get it. Okay, Even his early followers had to be instructed, and it was a process of revelation. But there's a second way that the word could be translated. Your margin might say it. New King James margin says it. That the light, or sorry, the darkness did not overcome the light. And that is more the idea. That there's a fight, you know, that you say, well, how was your day yesterday? And I say, well, <laughs> there was a lot of traffic, you know, between Birdsboro and Fayetteville, but they didn't overcome me. And you right away, you're picturing in your mind, maybe the Vikings on the bridges with their axes and their swords trying to keep me from Franklin County. Is this Franklin County? Oh, good. I'm glad I got that one right, at least. Anyway, trying to keep me from arriving. You see the opposition. You see people that are trying to stop me. You see toll booths rising up before me to try and keep me from there. And I say, they didn't overcome me. I prevailed. Well, if you follow this word in its 15 occurrences in the New Testament, you can find occurrences where it has that idea of being seized or being grabbed uh, to, to oppose, to fight, to be adversarial. And you can also find it the former way, the first way I mentioned of understanding. It. But there's a third way that's possible, and I like the meaning here. It says, for instance, in the American Standard 1901, and a lot of other translations, by the way, that the darkness did not apprehend it. Now, what is the difference between comprehend and apprehend? Well, it's the thought that the darkness didn't appropriate the truth to itself. Not only did it say, well, we heard Jesus or we heard people talking about Jesus and we really didn't get who he was. We really didn't understand what that was all about. Now, the word apprehend is more the idea here. They didn't take it in and receive it. Now, Nathaniel's the opposite. He's what we should do. When he was confronted with the light, initially he didn't understand, but when he actually met the light for himself, he received that light. He said, in other words, yes, you're Messiah. You're the son of God. You're the king of Israel. You're the one who's been promised. You're the one I've been waiting for. The one I've been meditating upon. And he wasn't wrong. But the light shining in the darkness... The darkness never received him, never appropriated him, not only misunderstood the Lord, but didn't want to receive the truth about the Lord, didn't want to submit to the Lord, didn't want to bow the knee and say, my Lord and my God. 
to the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet that's the truth of what we'll see through the rest of the Bible and through the rest of John, for that matter. That's why John is written. These things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the son of God and believing you might have life through his name. Chapter 19 will tell us Uh, chapter 20, excuse me, at the end of the chapter will tell us now, even as we think about that. There's a man called John who comes and he wasn't that light. We're told he was sent to bear witness to that light. And this is the reason because God, he's not out there hiding from people. People think God is distant. People think God is hard to know. But God has come seeking man the same way he always has. In Genesis 3, when Adam sinned and Adam and Eve's first instinct was to hide from God, Because they realized their shame, their nakedness. God came saying, Adam, where are you? Now, the omniscient God, the God who knows everything. Did he not know where Adam was? (laughs) Of course he knew where he was. He could have told him GPS coordinates if Adam would have understood such a thing. You know, he could tell him exactly the number of molecules under his feet and where he was standing upon. Again, if he could understand such a thing. God knew where he was. But God's saying right there in Genesis 3, I've lost something. I've lost fellowship with man because of sin. And I'm coming seeking man, as the Lord Jesus would put it in Luke 19.10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And think of it. He says in verse 12, but to as many as we're told, by the way, there's some parallelism here. Verse 10 Sorry, go, but yeah, verse 10. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. Now, there's a little nuance there. The ESV brings it out well. The margin of the New King James does, too. He came to his own things. In other words, the world he had made, all of creation and his own people did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become the children of God to those who believe in his name. Now, you see that the end of verse five, the darkness did not apprehend it. They didn't appropriate the truth. They didn't grab onto the truth and say, that's for me. I want the Lord Jesus, as the old hymn says, Christ for me, Christ for me. They didn't say that he shines in the darkness and the darkness didn't want it, essentially. We look at verse 10, he comes to the world he made and the world did not know him. And verse 12 goes on and says, but as many as received him, he gave the right to become the children of God who were born, not of blood. So it's not your physical descendancy. It's for Jew or Gentile. It's for Pennsylvania Germans and Irish and Scottish and African and Asian and who knows what else. Fill in the blank. Everybody, because it's not of the will of blood. Nor of the will of flesh. This is not man's self-exertion, not man's works righteousness, not man cultivating and building up an approach to God, because we can never do that. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. Nor of the will of man. So no particular human thinker, philosopher, sage, rabbi, guru, preacher has ever come up with this message. This is of God. And that's what Christmas is all about, isn't it? That the light has shone in the darkness and the light is shining still. That the Lord Jesus would call himself in John 8 and John 9, the light of the world. And the Lord is still shining the light through his word, through his people. As we take the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ out, we say this eternal God, this God who's always been, he's had a good thing going, you know. He had this undisturbed, undisturbed repose. He had this great relationship of father, son and spirit. But the son left that came down to earth. Why? So that he says the word became flesh. And tabernacled amongst us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. The Lord came so that we could be brought into this right relationship with God. The Lord came so that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Even the life of God. The life that comes from knowing God. So as 1 John 5 puts it very simply. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. It's. Pretty simple. The billboards say, got milk. We might ask people, got 
the Lord Jesus Christ? Is that whom you have this Christmas? Because that changes everything, not only for time, but for eternity. Father, we're thankful for thy word. Thankful for this good news of the Lord Jesus. We're thankful for the greatness of our God, who in spite of human darkness, in spite of our slowness, our dullness in thought and word and deed, that he would come and enlighten us. He would shine on us and show us the brilliant beauty of the God of heaven. The one who made us and made us to have a relationship with thyself. We thank thee for this. And we pray that we would be diligent in telling others in the time we have remaining. We ask it in the Lord Jesus Christ's name. Amen.